What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. So in 10 days, God of War Ragnarok will finally release Sony's big holiday game, but there's a bit of an issue here as it looks like there's going to be a bunch of spoilers potentially getting out there on the way to release to where Sony has now even issued a warning. We'll go over that here today. Also, we are gonna be talking about that Bayonetta 3 boycott that was apparently happening leading up to release because we have some initial sales information we can take a look at. And we're also gonna be talking about Square Enix and how they apparently have to be looking outside of Japan for some of their newer titles. Guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure you hit that like button, helps out a ton. And if you're new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And we're gonna start today with Sonic Frontiers. That actually coming out a day before God of War Ragnarok. So that'll be a very interesting 48 hours there. But we now know when reviews will be going live for Sonic Frontiers, which of course has drummed up all kinds of predictions around what kind of Metacritic score it will get. But we can see this posted up on Twitter by Metacritic, new and upcoming games calendar, November 8th, Sonic Frontiers with reviews for Sonic Frontiers going live early November 7th, so the day before the game comes out, this is going to be an interesting one. I, I actually asked that for the poll question where everyone kind of fell on the range of scores, whether it's a an eight in the 80s, the 90s, somewhere in there, or lower, maybe in the 60s or the 70s. Uh, again, a lot of opinions as to where this game is gonna fall in terms of scores, but we'll talk about that later on with the poll. Also, we did have Xbox Live Games with Gold revealed for the month of November. Remember, the, these are like the games that get add it in where you can just claim them and add them to your library to go along with that subscription. They had removed the Xbox 360 backwards compatible games. They just said we're not doing them anymore. And once again, they replaced them with, well, nothing. We can take a look at the November games here. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it's not great. There's Praetorians, Praetorians, that's an HD remaster. That's November 1st to the 30th. And Dead End Job, available November 16th to... December 15th, I hadn't heard of either of these games until it showed up here with Games with Gold. They have a $37 value attached to it with 2,000 gamer score. So again, that's one way, I guess, to, to advertise or for people to care enough to claim these. I mean, it's part of your subscription for Games with Gold. You might, you might as well, but I understand why some people may just not even spend the time doing that. It's, it hasn't been good for a while. And really, if you think about it, the cloud saves, that's just part of Xbox Live. It's not even behind the Xbox Live Gold. Really, it's just an online multiplayer. And I think some features for party chat, Otherwise, there, there's not a lot really holding up that Xbox Live Gold subscription service. So I do wonder if they're getting us to a point where we don't care much at all about the games, those get phased out, and then maybe Microsoft actually makes a move to eliminate the need to pay for online completely. That would be a really cool thing to see them do and maybe even steer the industry in that direction. We don't have to pay to play online, but we'll see. Maybe they just decide to keep giving us these kind of months for games with gold for the next couple of years. Oh, and of course we did have Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 releasing on Friday with the multiplayer. The campaign had been live for at least a week before that, but we did have some concurrent player numbers come in on Steam, which you can see. I mean, this game has been sitting around the 230 to 260,000 mark this entire time. It's it's pretty impressive stuff. I think the last Call of Duty game that was on Steam was one of the Black Ops and the roof we saw in for that release was like 60 or 70,000. So this is significantly higher and not a shock, obviously. It's Call of Duty. It does well every single year, but it does show what a release on a Steam will do for the game as opposed to being just completely relegated to that uh, battle.net launcher. So, hey, there's Call of Duty. It makes sense. Modern Warfare 2. It's actually a lot of fun. I'm enjoying it here and there with multiplayer, mostly in short spurts, jumping on for maybe 20 to 30 minutes at a time. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with God of War Ragnarok releasing November 9th. Again, very excited for this title. Been looking forward to it for a while but it appears someone else is enjoying it actually right now outside of reviewers. We can see this posted up by Corey Barlog, and I noticed this where he said, you know, right now I can really understand the benefit of having just an installer on the physical disc. Remember, we're, we're talking about Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, the disc itself is 70 megabytes, and then you just download the rest. Well, I, I saw this, that's an interesting thing to tweet out, and then the, re the response to this under, under that tweet 
He said a, a retailer selling the game nearly two weeks before release. Just so disappointing. All right, so from what I can tell, looking around, Target is the retailer that's, that's being brought up as selling the copy early, or is called Breaking Street Date on God of War Ragnarok, which is kind of a sticky situation for Sony. And in fact, we have this message here. This was put out by Sony Santa Monica, where they say, as we approach launch, it is important for our studio to preserve the experience of God of War Ragnarok for players who want to enjoy the game for the first time without spoilers. We ask that you please be considerate of the many fans who do not want to accidentally see clips, gameplay, or narrative spoilers and avoid sharing them wider. We are doing our best to limit the exposure of unsanctioned footage and screenshots, but the reality is that we cannot catch everything. For those uh, for those of you who do not want to risk seeing anything before launch, we strongly advise that you mute any keywords or hashtags associated with the game until release day. We appreciate the support. You've shown us more than we can say. We can assure you it will be worth the wait to experience the game yourself when it released in less than two weeks on November 9th. Now, the main issue that Sony runs into is technically if somebody buys it legally from a retail establishment and it's not the game stolen out of, out of their studio or code is pulled off of a server or something like that, I mean, yeah, they can post up videos and clips and, and images and all of this. And it's kind of this gray area for Sony where it's like, do we strike this stuff down even though it's not something that we can necessarily control through embargoes that you would have reviewers sign? And I kind of feel like it, it would be difficult for them to back that up necessarily, which is one of the reasons I'm telling you now, be careful because people do have this game and you're probably going to see things posted up on Twitter, Facebook, any social media, obviously on YouTube with thumbnails potentially, and really the entire ending. The entire ending for Bayonetta 3 even got out there early, but obviously with the Switch, it's a little different since the game can be dumped online fairly easily. The PlayStation, a little harder, especially if it's like the PS5. The PS4, technically you can do it, but it's you're typically working with with God of War Ragnarok, 80 to 90 gigabytes, uploading, storing, distributing that becomes a bit more difficult. So here's hoping for everyone looking forward to God of War Ragnarok, you're able to avoid any of the major spoilers to get out there. Also, I noticed Skill Up mentioning that even reviewers will have a hard time talking about the game without spoiling it for people. It sounds like this game, as soon as it gets going right away, major events are happening and you show gameplay a couple hours in even, you're probably spoiling something serious in the storyline itself. So, hey, hopefully people who are able to get to the game on November 9th without having anything spoiled. So good luck and maybe go mute some keywords here and there on places like Twitter. Next up, let's talk about Metal Gear Solid. And this was an interesting one because there are a lot of rumors as to Konami doing things like Silent Hill turned out to be correct. But alongside of that, we had rumors for Metal Gear Solid and Castlevania. And in fact, one studio in particular was brought up for Metal Gear and that's Metal Gear Solid 3 being remade by Virtuo. Sounds like a, like an interesting story, right? Wow, that'd be really cool if we had a full remake of Metal Gear Solid 3. Well, we had a cameo from Metal Gear Solid in a video out of Virtuos's Montreal studio. This isn't a video that's been up for about a week and people notice this going through it. We can see uh, Lewis here, the concept artist, talking uh, on camera. And all the way on the right, there's um, the art of Metal Gear Solid. I mean, it's, it's all the way, like, you have to really like look around to notice it. Yeah, so obviously what this has done is stirred up a lot of speculation once again, because I mean, there's a video here with Virtuos kind of doing a studio tour, talking about what they do day to day and their plans for the future. And there just happens to be a Metal Gear Solid cameo. Could it be a coincidence? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe they just really like the art of Metal Gear Solid. It's not hard to believe that you may look back on some of that artwork to get inspiration for current concept art that you're doing, but it is, uh, it would be quite the coincidence, wouldn't it, to be hearing about Virtuos doing a Metal Gear Solid 3 remake, and then, oh, there's Metal Gear Solid with a very large book of artwork that maybe they would want to make sure is true to the overall series past. But hey, the Game Awards right around the corner, I mean, that would be a really cool place to announce Metal Gear Solid 3 Remake and have, I would say, Konami show that they are absolutely back and heading into gaming in full force once again because we hear about Silent Hill, turns out to be correct. We hear about Metal Gear Solid, if that's correct, 
does that also mean that Castlevania could see some sort of revival? I, I think 2023 is gonna be a lot of fun. Next up, let's talk about Bayonetta 3. It was out on Friday. I picked it up. I've been playing more and more of it, and it is a really good game, despite the technical limitations that it's kind of working within on the Switch. The game itself is, I mean, the moment-to-moment -moment action is, I mean, really untouched from what I've experienced so far. But there, of course, was the question around Helena Taylor and the situation there with the, the voice acting, the payments, and uh, then we had the boycott brought up by Helena Taylor herself. She's gone on to say more and more stuff on Twitter that has not at all helped her situation. But I was curious when it comes to the overall sales for Bayonetta 3. I have a feeling it will be the best selling in the series, but that's not going to be very difficult because the entirety of Bayonetta, I think, has sold just over 3 million copies like completely. Well, we are getting some initial sales information. We will get a bit more throughout this week that we'll be taking a look at here. But first, let's start with the eShop. It has now topped the Japan eShop, which is great news, obviously for digital sales on the Switch. And when it comes to the US eShop, which I think is the market that really has a chance to push Bayonetta to three to become the best selling in the series, is sitting around number two. And that's just behind the Mario Rabbids Sparks of Hope. And that's a game with Mario directly directly on the front. Now, when it comes to the UK, we expect to get some sort of indication through sales charts, and at times, Christopher Dring sort of talking about some of the data on Twitter, and we can see this posted up there, saying Bayonetta 3's UK sales are very marginally bigger than what Bayonetta 2 managed on Switch back in 2018. Again, this is purely physical retail data. I'm, I'm seeing marginally bigger, so I know it says very marginally bigger. I am assuming this is just similar, or maybe a little more than what we saw with Bayonetta 2, which again was a port to the Switch in 2018. So it, it doesn't sound like it was an overwhelming amount compared to what we saw with, uh, with Bayonetta 2. Again, these are physical sales here, but it is our first indication that at least in the UK, Bayonetta 3 isn't exactly like lighting the sales charts on fire or anything. However, we should see like the top 10 released at some point today and we'll get a better indication as to where it sits. I will say Japan will be very interesting. We'll have hard numbers to compare to Bayonetta 2 on the Wii U and it, it already topping the eShop chart on the Switch. For example, with Bayonetta 2, this was back in 2014, a bit of a blast from the past on this one, but I mean, we could see Bayonetta 2 coming in at number three, 38,828 copies sold on the Wii U. I expect the Switch to do better than this by, I would say a decent margin. Like I, I think people are looking at Bayonetta 3 as a 50 to 60,000 unit seller physically, of course, in Japan. And then you can almost, I would say, double that to get the digital games involved. So at that point, it'd be like 100,000 sold overall. I think that'd be really, really good for Bayonetta 3. But I guess we'll see a bit more about this later on in the week when those charts are released. But to me, looking at this now, doesn't really seem like the boycott that was being called for by Helena Taylor is really doing that much to affect sales, especially when you look at the eShop. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about Square Enix because they shared information with their most recent financial quarter with investors and they talked about some of their strategies moving forward, which still includes NFTs and blockchain. So we'll see how that works out with Square Enix. But they did also talk about Japan and the market itself maybe not being enough for them to remain profitable going forward. We can see this posted up. This was over on Push Square, where they say achieving major growth in the game industry is difficult now for companies that compete primarily in the Japanese market. Given its graying demographics, I assume that this means people are just getting older there, more mature, maybe expecting certain things from their games now, saying as such, it is crucial for our business that we produce hit titles that speak to the global market, which offers greater scale in terms of both customers and sales volume. They go on to say the Japanese market is no longer sufficient for achieving a level of earnings that enables us to recoup our development investment and generate a profit. And we therefore need to approach our development efforts based on the assumption that we have to succeed in the global market. This, this is a very strange thing to hear Square say after they basically offloaded all of their Western development studios for the most part, and even intellectual properties that did pretty well with Western audiences, something like Tomb Raider. Uh, now they're like, oh wait, we need the Western audience, which 
To be fair, with where we're heading with some of these ballooning game development costs, you can't rely on one region anyway. Like you have to really look around and target just the global audience. And I think that's why we're seeing changes that we are right now with Final Fantasy, where people are noticing, oh, Final Fantasy 16 seems much more action oriented. Some are even comparing it to Devil May Cry, as opposed to it being the traditional menu system, which is something we've kind of gotten away from for a while now. Also, the more Square Enix talks about game development costs and splitting up studios to have more and more people invest in different properties, the more it sounds like they are indeed looking to be purchased by someone. I don't know if anyone's gonna come in anytime soon and pick up Square Enix, but I, I guess you could see different uh, investments being put into individual studios behind Final Fantasy. You could see Sony come in and drop some money there. You could see Nintendo show up and drop some money uh, for some of these HD 2D games. It definitely seems that Square is out there looking for investments and cash infusion to help take some of the risk off the table for these very expensive game development costs. When you look at something like Final Fantasy 16, that does not look like a cheap game to put together. But I guess we'll see what happens with that when it releases next year. But Square Enix is a... Uh, they're saying some very odd things, uh, at least from what I'm seeing so far with investors in this latest report. And before we go to the comments of the day, we're gonna take a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday, where we say, predict the Sonic Frontiers Metacritic score. I, 3% really getting after it, 90 to 100, I respect it. 24% though, 80 to 89, and then 53%, 70 to 79, and wow, 7% of people think this game is gonna be Maybe worse than Sonic Forces. Whew. I I am torn between the 80 to 89 and the 70 to 79 because I think it's either going to be high 70s or low 80s. I think it'll be mid to high 70s if the game is large in scope but buggy to where it is detracting from the experience. And I think it could be low 80s if the game just works. It's not all broken and, and, and bug riddled and all these things because the scope that they're going for is impressive when you think about it coming from Sega and Sonic Team, and it's them trying something brand new with the Sonic franchise. So I'm holding out hope that it all works out and we see a 3D Sonic game show up that's like mid 80s even, that would be impressive stuff, but you never know, they could always put out a Sonic Forces. I mean, we've seen them do that. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Dog saying, the thing that annoys me most with all, the all digital future is publishers actively removing your choice from us to force us into it whether we want it or not, whilst claiming that's what everybody wants. Obviously there's still a viable market for physical, hence it's still existing to begin with. But you see what like Corey Barlog had said, hey, you know, I get it. You have an installer on a disc that's 70 megabytes, I don't really care if the disc gets out there because we're the ones who flip the servers on and we also control how many reviewers have the game and, and all these different things. So there's a lot more control when we get to a position of it just being all digital. And that's one of the other reasons on top of obviously the money and the revenue split that all these publishers and developers want us to work towards that. I mean, hey, you get even more control by the way when it's all cloud gaming. So. That'll be fun like 10 or 15 years from now. And ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today. We're Sony issuing a warning now for people looking forward to God of War. Might wanna make sure you're muting certain keywords on Twitter. And then also, what about Virtuos having Metal Gear Solid spotted on their desk? Do you think they're really working on a Metal Gear Solid 3 remake? And then Bayonetta 3, do you think this boycott is having any effect on the sales? Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.